Hi there, welcome everyone to today's quarterly GR update. Please note that this Zoom webinar is being recorded. My name is Jessica Bruton. I'm the new manager of education and events here at NAEA, and I'll be today's technology webinar moderator. I'd also like to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. To ask any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A box. We will not be taking questions from the chat, we have enabled the upvoting feature. If you see a question and you want to make sure it gets asked, you can click the thumbs up symbol on the question in the Q&A box. We'll be taking questions from the Q&A box only today. To ask questions to the moderator about NAEA or technical issues, this can be asked in chat with the Greater Webinar audience. Remember when making a comment to the whole webinar to choose everyone, if you have a technical issue and would like to send me a direct message, that's an option as well. Please know everyone can see the chat, so please be respectful to your fellow learners and use the chat to share information and ideas regarding the presentation material. If you required, require closed captioning, click the show captions button on the bottom of your Zoom platform. You may need to hit the more button as well. At this time, I'd like to introduce Michelle. She's the NAEA Director of Government Relations, and she will kick us off. Welcome, everyone. Today is our, I guess, our second quarterly update. We had one in January, I guess, but wasn't a quarterly one. Then we did a we did a secure 2.0 webinar for you. So this is really our first quarterly for, for 2023. Um, I'm happy to uh, introduce that in. She's going to handle the lion's share of this presentation today. That is our legislative council. And I will be jumping in with Q&A and, and spiffy comments every once in a while. So that over to you. Great. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, uh, Jessica. I'm glad to be with everyone. I hope it's uh, not too cold and rainy where you are. It's, a, it's, it's not too cold in DC, but it is rainy. And um, we will jump into this. Let's see the, uh, I told, there we go. Uh, whenever we go live, the slides stick for a little while, which uh, we were talking about before. But um, so for the agenda um, today, uh, we're gonna try to give a flavor of the new Congress and some of the new players that are there, some of the changes that have happened since last year. I know we've talked some about the elections. This won't be so much on the elections, but just sort of how things are shaping up uh, with the new Congress, with the new committees, the leadership, both for Congress as a whole and in the tax committees that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, some of the committee priorities, uh, they've shifted some since last Congress, especially in the House. And so uh, we'll touch on that. And then just some legislative priorities and, and must pass legislation uh, that we will likely see um, in the coming months. Um, and then we'll uh, turn to the IRS uh, some some of the recent things that have been going on there around the $80 billion that they received in the Inflation Reduction Act, and then good timing on the IRS Commissioner uh, nominee Danny Werfel, um, because they did have the confirmation hearing yesterday before the Senate Finance Committee. Um, I got to go in person and watch that, so Michelle and I um, will we'll, uh, share a little bit about our thoughts on where that process stands and, and how he fared uh, before the committee. Um, um, yesterday. Let's see. So just to kind of frame things, um, we are back to a divided Congress. Uh, we're back to a divided government. Of course, the first two years um, of the Biden administration, we had a, a Democratic House of Representatives in a very, very narrow Democratic um, Senate with 50-50 Kamala Harris breaking the vote. Um, the Senate is now 51-49 Democratic um, but uh, the House, of course, went Republican. And so it creates new challenges to governing uh, because compromise is required to get anything passed. And so we sort of led, um, you know, in the past, I've said, will it be gridlock or compromise? Uh, uh, for this one, we just said, will governing be possible? And I think that's obviously a topic in the news. It's a big question mark as we see the debt ceiling and some other stuff uh, come up. Um, and so you know, every Congress looks different. Obviously you have new players, um, new priorities. 
And uh, even in the Senate, uh, that's no different um, this time around, although there are a lot of similarities. So you've got 51 uh, Democrats. The, the one seat that was flipped uh, for Democrats was uh, Pennsylvania, um, where uh, uh, Senator Toomey retired and Lieutenant Governor Fetterman uh, won that seat. It was obviously a, a, a very high profile seat, um, but, um, but obviously some new players as well. Um, in Alabama, uh, Katie Britt is the new senator from, um, from Alabama, one of the youngest senators, I think the second youngest senator ever elected at, at 40 years old. Uh, she took Richard Shelby's um, place, who was an institution uh, in Alabama and in the Senate as the as um, the lead Republican on the Appropriations Committee. Um, Eric Schmidt was elected um, in Missouri. Uh, he had been the Attorney General. Um, Ted Budd uh, was elected. He took Richard Burr's place in North Carolina. He was a congressman and uh, moved up to the Senate. Um, and then similar with uh, Mark Wayne Mullen was a congressman uh, that moved up to the Senate. And, and probably the most uh, famous freshman uh, is J.D. Vance in Ohio. Um, he was the author of the Hillbilly Elegy, if anyone uh, read that book, and um, went on to um, do venture capital and various things, and then uh, win the Senate seat um, for, um, from Ohio, taking Rob Portman's place. Rob Portman had been a real, real leader on a lot of, a lot of our um, issues. Uh, so those are the, um, the five new Republican senators um, in, the, uh, in the Senate. And then there are two new Democratic senators, one John Fetterman, who I mentioned, uh, one that uh, race against Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania, um, and then Peter Welch, who had been the congressman for Vermont. Um, I believe Vermont just has one congressman, so he was an at-large congressman and um, now uh, took uh, Pat Leahy's place. Pat Leahy, longtime senator from Vermont, was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and so Peter Welch uh, stepped up to take his place. Um, the House, uh, obviously, um, it flipped with Repub Republicans taking charge. They've got 222 seats right now. Democrats have 212. As far as, as, far as the House goes, it's a, a, a pretty narrow majority. Um, it's similar to what Nancy Pelosi had, uh, although flipped last Congress, uh, with Democrats having um, around 222 votes. And if you look at, um, there's 75 new House members. And I thought this chart was pretty interesting because, you know, I know we talked a lot during the election after the election about uh, the red wave, potential red wave. And, um, and when you look, and, and that didn't materialize, but when you look at the new members of Congress, you see just how narrow it was. 41 new Republicans elected, 34 uh, new Democrats. So um, pretty evenly split, although enough, you know, towards Republicans for them to be able to take the majority. and then. Uh, Texas, New York, North Carolina, Florida, California, those were all sort of the instrumental states in deciding, um, deciding uh, uh, the House. And so new leadership. And, you know, we went over all the politics in the, in the webinars before, so I didn't want to spend too much time on that. But Michelle, anything to add before we start talking about the, the new leadership? No, I think you're, you're sailing smoothly, Thad. All right, sounds good. So we've got pictures here of um, Kevin McCarthy, the new speaker, who will talk about Hakeem Jeffries, the new Democratic leader in the House. And then the bottom right is Patty Murray, who's part of the Democratic leadership in the Senate, is also the new um, chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. So Senate leadership, we really didn't see a ton of change here. Um, since Democrats did keep the majority in the in the um, Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer still majority leader. Uh, Patty Murray is the president pro tem, which is the longest serving senator in the ma majority party. Um, Dick Durbin uh, is the, from Illinois, is the majority whip, and then Debbie Stabenow from Michigan is the chair of the Policy and Communications Committee. She recently announced her retirement, and so this will be her last two years. Um, her last two years in the Senate. And then on the uh, Republican side, of course, Mitch McConnell from Kentucky is the, uh, remains the minority leader. John Thune from South Dakota is an important member of the, um, the Finance Committee who we work with. Uh, John Barrasso 
um, from Wyoming, also an important member of the Finance Committee uh, that we work with. And then also Joni Ernst uh, from Iowa is the Republican uh, Policy Committee Chairman. Um, so I know everyone followed this in the news, watched every single vote, every single speech um, in that riveting uh, few days of, of action. Um, but Kevin McCarthy, um, while it looked a little dicey there for a few days and folks were wondering uh, if he was gonna have to drop out, um, he did after 15 ballots, uh, narrowly win uh, the speakership with 216 votes. Um, there was sort of ongoing negotiations with his Republican counterparts. He did have to make a number of concessions uh, that will make it harder for him to kind of lead with an iron fist. Um, one is something called the motion to vacate the chair, which essentially um, allows any member to sort of call a vote to remove the speaker. Um, and they did not want to allow that just because it, it you know, can be a threat to a speaker. Um, they ended up having to cave on that. Um, they made some changes to how they'll handle appropriations bills where more amendments will be able to be offered. Um, the 72 hour publication of bills, this idea that you can't put a bill on the floor at the last minute, people need time to read it. And then one that's sort of insider baseball, but it's actually pretty important is rules committee appointments. So the rules committee in the house, it kind of defines the flow of legislation. So what makes it to the floor, how, how much time it'll have, how many amendments will be voted on. And normally it, it's also sometimes called the speaker's committee because the speaker stocks it with his allies and it allows him to kind of control what happens on the house floor. Well, a number of these um, more conservative Republicans that were challenging him uh, demanded more seats on that. So, um, and so a number of seats did go to some of McCarthy's challengers. And so they'll have more say in kind of, you know, the flow of legislation, what actually gets a vote, what amendments happen. Um, and so this, you know, we'll see um, how it plays out for McCarthy. Some feel like some of the things he gave away will really hamstring him, um, but it's, uh, you know, time, time will tell. Um, so looking sort of at the broader house leadership, you've got Steve Scalise from uh, New Orleans as majority leader, uh, Tom Emmer from Minnesota, Elise Stefanik um, from upstate New York. Um, and then on the democratic side, a lot of these were sort of new names to a lot of people because while they were known within DC, they had not, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi, um, Steny Hoyer and, uh, and Congressman Clyburn had, had been at the leadership for so long um, that the new generation sort of hadn't had the spotlight. Well, of course, uh, Nancy Pelosi decided to step aside as did Steny Hoyer and Hakeem Jeffries from New York is the new minority leader. Um, Catherine Clark from uh, Massachusetts is minority whip and Pete Aguilar from California is the Democratic caucus chairman. Uh, Clyburn is staying around in leadership and sort of an advisory advisory role. So tax committees, a lot of the work that we do at NAEA um, obviously goes through the tax committees, um, both the Finance Committee in the Senate and the um, Ways and Means Committee in the House. Uh, they both are the authorizing agencies for the IRS um, and for Treasury, um, but also just have um, jurisdiction over uh, tax policy um, legislation and so most of our stuff uh, touches on these committees. We work closely with them. That's where the PAC is sort of involved mainly. Um, and so the, um, the Senate Finance Committee stayed pretty stable. Um, there were some staffing changes and stuff, but Ron Wyden uh, from Oregon is still um, the uh, chairman. And we've got Mike Crapo staying on as the ranking member, the lead Republican. Um, and we have three new members to the committee. Uh, you look at the House committees, they've got you know, lots of new members um, just because of the, the turnover there, um, but um, only three new members on the Senate Finance Committee. Um, Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, who just won re-election, uh, Tom Tillis uh, from North Carolina, and Marsha Blackburn um, from Tennessee. And uh, they were, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the Werfel hearing uh, yesterday, but they were all at the Werfel hearing um, yesterday and, um, and contributed and kind of played a big role 
Uh, so they're they're all veteran um, senators, and so they won't sort of have training wheels at all on on that committee. Um, I will say the the House, I mean the Democratic side of the Senate Finance Committee stayed the exact same, uh, which is kind of which which is interesting. But they um, they uh, have the exact same members as as last time. Um, so House Ways and Means leadership. This is kind of where the fireworks were. Obviously, at the top in the House, you had fireworks around Speaker McCarthy. Can he become Speaker? Um, sort of a microcosm of, you know, of that a little bit was what was happening um, over the last year as uh, a few people jockeyed to be chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Vern Buchanan, who's on the far right, was kind of the front runner uh, for most of last year a veteran congressman from, from Florida, a wealthy businessman, raises a lot of money, uh, someone that works closely with the business community, and NAEA had, had supported him. Um, you had Adrian Smith from Nebraska, who's not on this slide, but was um, another, another person in the running. And then you had Jason Smith from Missouri, who's younger. He's like early 40s. Um, he's seen more in the mold as a, tr a Trump supporter, more populist. Uh, more in tune with uh, rural issues, wanting to shake things up a little bit, um, but was a close ally of, of Kevin McCarthy. And he was kind of the dark horse that emerged as, you know, the front runner at the very end. Um, he ended up getting the votes on the steering committee uh, to win the chairman. So Jason Smith is the new chairman. Uh, Richie Neal, who was chairman last Congress, has been, you know, on ways and means forever, uh, will remain the, um, the Democratic leader. And so lots of new faces um, on the um, Republican side of House Ways and Means. Uh, because the ratios change when, when Republicans take over, um, they picked up eight seats, Republicans did. Uh, Democrats actually lost a few seats. So the committee's the same, although a few of the newer members um, had, to, had to drop off. I think the ratio is 25 to 18. So the majority gets 25 seats, the minority gets 18. Yeah. Michelle's shaking her head, yes. So um, the uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, um, moderate from Pennsylvania, Greg Stubbe from Florida, uh, Blake Moore from Utah, Beth Van Dyne from Texas, uh, Claudia Tenney from New York, Michelle uh, Fishbach from Minnesota, Michelle Steele from California, and Mike Carey from Ohio. Most of these are veteran congressmen. Ways and Means is considered an A committee. It's probably one of the most desirable committees. And so you have folks that have been around for a few terms. Well, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a promotion, if you will, that they get, they get moved up to the, uh, to the Ways and Means Committee. And we've already made our rounds with a few of these folks, but you know, NAEA will make sure that the new members on the committee knows who we are and, and cares about our issues. Um, I put this up just to, uh, just to touch on um, um, the Appropriations Committee because um, the Subcommittee on Financial Services and General Government is what funds um, the IRS and Treasury and some other agencies, but the IRS is mainly our big focus. And when Steny Hoyer stepped down as the minority or the majority whip, but when he didn't run for leadership this time, he, um, he went back to appropriations and took his old position as, as the lead Democrat on this subcommittee. He's a big proponent of protecting IRS funding um, because he's in a Maryland suburb, has a lot of IRS employees that live in his district. And so uh, we expect that, um, that he'll be an ally in trying to make sure that the IRS sort of in their annual appropriations um, remains uh, well-funded. Of course, Chris Van Hollen, uh, on the Senate side from is also from Maryland. And so will be another person that, that is sort of sensitive to, to um, IRS funding and, and, and making sure they're, they're well staffed. Um, and then Bill Haggerty and Steve Womack, we don't have any, any issues with them. I think they'll be, they'll be good to work with. So I hope that wasn't too much. I just wanted to give everybody sort of a, uh, a sense that we've got new players in town. We're on we're on top of that, and 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 we're trying to you know um, navigate this new Congress. Um, but moving into more of the policy side, uh, 
of course, all these new people come with new priorities um, and, and some old priorities. Um, but if you look at the House Ways and Means Committee uh, for 2023 with Jason Smith taking over, it really is a more populist approach, um, which means he's very much, you know, says he's not there to sort of protect corporations or protect the wealthy. Um, he's focused on rural areas. Um, he's focused on small businesses. He's focused on poverty and families. And so they held their first um, hearing, and this hadn't happened in apparently like 10 years, um, but they did a field hearing in West Virginia rather than do sort of your typical first big hearing in, in Washington. Um, and I, I understand that McCarthy doesn't have a lot of committees do this, um, but they went down to West Virginia. Um, a lot of the members uh, showed up and they heard from their thing was they wanted to hear from, you know, regular people, small business owners, um, workers. Um, and so that was last Monday. And, you know, a lot of the topics that they're talking about, inflation, obviously a big one, um, the labor shortage for small businesses, um, creating more jobs, uh, promoting trade policies that open markets for American goods. So a little more hard line on, on the trade policies and then extending the tax cuts from the, um, uh, the tax bill under Trump that passed in 2017. A lot of those provisions are expiring uh, in 2025. So they're not coming up this year, but they're already kind of top of mind about what might get extended and, um, and what won't. And so this slide was trying to just give you a little flavor while also, you know, while focusing more on these populist issues, Jason Smith's also a lot more hard hitting when it comes to taking on the Biden administration, uh, providing oversight of, of IRS. And, um, and so that's gonna be a big focus of the committee. Um, one of the first things he did, and, and NAEA did meet with him in, in December, by the way, and kind of talked to him about our, our priorities. And one of the things that, that he said was that he wanted to create this direct line of communication for whistleblowers. Um, so, so whistleblowers could, could have more of a voice and be more protected. Um, that was one of his first announcements in January. Um, was announcing this um, whistleblower line. Um, he's also been pretty vocal um, on a range of stuff around IRS. He came out with a big release yesterday about what the IRS nominee needed to answer. Michelle and I were chuckling a little bit because the Senate never likes it when House members start talking about their advice and consent role. Um, they sort of feel like, you know, we get to decide who gets confirmed and then the House can have their crack at them. <laughs> um, but he came out with a long list of, of what Werfel needed to answer in order to be um, confirmed. And, um, and then, of course, the 80 billion, you know, big focus for, for everyone, but especially Republicans on the oversight side saying, what's the plan? How's this money going to be spent? You know, we don't want more audits. We don't want uh, more aggressive action against small businesses, you know, regular taxpayers, um, that kind of thing. Um, Michelle, I know you've been following the Jason Smith stuff closely. Any anything to add on on that? Um, not not specifically on this issue, this part of it. Um, can I can I um, give a plug to the fly-in? Yes, go for it. <laughs> well, you know, we're having a fly-in on May twenty May, May twenty three and twenty four, and one of the uh, activities at that event is for, called the Congressional Club breakfast for some of the higher givers. And um, Jason Smith is, has agreed to be the speaker at that Congressional Club breakfast. So if you're planning to come to the fly-in and you want to be part of the Congressional Club, please do and uh, hear what Jason Smith has to say. Um, we've had some good conversations with him and they seem uh, eager to uh, communicate with us and work with us. So all, all good news. Yeah, and that was, and that's a big get for NAEA because, you know, it seems like in, insider baseball, and it is, but to be the new chairman of the Ways and Means Committee is a big deal in DC. Um, because NAEA had supported him, um, I went to a reception in January uh, to thank his supporters. And this, I mean, it was packed and not just with, you know, groups like ours, but also with other congressmen. And he's kind of the new, you know, the new superstar in DC because he was able to get this position. And so 
the fact that we were able to start building relationship early, that he's agreed to come speak at this congressional breakfast, I think um, will will provide dividends uh, for us long term. And it allows us to have a, you know, to be a voice of, of reason too. There's been a lot of political rhetoric around the IRS, $80 billion, 87,000, you know, guard <laughs> agents, all of that. We obviously don't try to get, you know, we try to stay out of the politics of it, but we do, you know, talk about what the needs of the IRS are, which is one of the things we've expressed to them. Like, hey, we understand, you know, you might not have been for this 80 billion, but let me tell you what the phone situation is. Let me tell you what the technology situation is. Let me tell you what CAF is and how it can be improved. And and a lot of times these members really will listen um, because, um, you know, they they have they have constituents too that are very frustrated with waiting on the phones, not being able to you know get their ERTC refund or or whatever the issue might be. So Senate Finance Committee, same leadership um, with Wyden at the top. Um, a big priority for them is going to be the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there's lots of climate and energy provisions. Um, guidance is already starting to sort of slowly come out on that. Um, and then the $80 billion for IRS, uh, another priority, making sure that that is successful. Um, and then housing is a, is a big one for, um, for Widen as well. Um, creating a new middle income housing tax credit, improving the low income housing tax credit. Uh, so those are a few of the priorities that um, Senate Finance Committee will uh, are planning to focus on. So broader legislative priorities in Congress, those are obviously specific to the tax world and specific to the committees, um, but we're hearing lots in the news about, you know, all kinds of issues. Um, also, as I said in that first slide, um, with a divided Congress, it's very hard to get stuff done. And so what's realistic is always, you know, the first question. But there are some must do items. One, I'm sure everyone's been hearing about in the news and that's the debt ceiling extension. Um, yesterday, um, they came out and said, sometime between July and September uh, is when we need to increase the, the debt ceiling by without default. I guess technically we already, we already hit it a few weeks ago, but they're, they're doing what they call extraordinary measures to, um, to allow um, you know, us to keep spending. Um, and, but as early as July, you know, or maybe a few months after they've got to get this um, extension increased or the, or the US government would default. Um, hugely political issue in that a lot of uh, Republicans of the house are saying we want cuts to go along with this. Um, Biden yesterday was saying, well, when y'all raised it for Trump and there were no cuts associated with it. And so, They've kind of taken the hard line that the, the White House has is this is a routine thing that has to happen for the economy. There could be a separate discussion about, um, you know, cuts to government spending, um, but Republicans would like to tie, tie the two together. And so, you know, this will probably be a negotiation slash game of chicken, you know, down to the end. Um, there's sort of some disagreements within both of the parties. So there are a few Democrats saying we really should negotiate. There are other Republicans saying, let's just get this, you know, done and not and not risk the economy. Um, and so that's going to be a big issue for Congress um, in the coming months. Um, the appropriations bill, it's always a big, always a big issue. Can they come together and figure out how to pass the spending bill uh, for the next fiscal year? The national NDAA is the National Defense Authorization Act. That's a bill they have to do every year. They always get it done every year. Um, but it's one of those must do items that people will try to um, tag stuff onto. Uh, the farm bill is also up. That, that does not happen every year. I think it's every six years or something. And so that's a, a big deal. And then FAA author, reauthorization is one of the first things that's coming up, I think in maybe as early as March. Um, so those are, while Congress is divided, these are things that they pretty much don't have a choice. They have to get done. And so it can create op opportunity. Bipartisan possibilities, Ukraine is obviously remains a big deal. China, um, 
and sort of competition with China and, and now sort of the intelligence issues with the, the spying and stuff um, is a, a, an opportunity potentially for some legislation. Crypto regulation, um, obviously a big topic that's got some bipartisan um, appeal. Um, future pandemic readiness, uh, technical correction. Some, you know, since our Secure 2.0 presentation last month, um, some stuff has come out that the way they wrote the Roth provisions uh, weren't exactly correct and they need to fix that in the next year. Um, and so, or I should say catch up provisions. They changed the catch up provisions to Roth. And so they're gonna have to do some technical corrections around some of these big bills that were passed. And then tech privacy, um, uh, both privacy and antitrust are, are sort of issues that have been out there with the, with the big companies like Facebook and, and Amazon and Google. Um, so it will be hard to get anything done. I'll, I'll sort of make that clear. It's gonna be really hard to get stuff done, but there are things that they have to get done that they'll be forced to kind of like go to the table and compromise. And that always has, you know, sort of um, indirect or direct policy implications on, on the stuff we're doing. So we watch all of that very closely. So in the tax space, so one question that comes up a lot is, will there be a tax bill this year? And um, I don't think anyone knows that answer. I think that it's probably an uphill battle. Um, the where, where things ended at the end of last year is there was one major tax provision, quote unquote tax provision that made it on the final bill. And that was Secure 2.0, the retirement legislation. Most of the other stuff did not make it. And it really came down to these first two items. Um, the enhanced child tax credit that was under COVID um, had expired. So it still exists, but it's not the enhanced sort of beefed up version. A lot of Democrats wanted to increase that back up. Um, the R&D tax credit, um, as written in the, in the Trump tax law, was going from being able to expense these things in one year, so be able to do automatic expense expensing for um, for R and D expenses, to having to take that over. I think it's a five five year period or something like that. And so, uh, corporate America businesses, um, a lot of a lot of people in both parties were saying we've got to you know fix this where folks can take this in one year. Or it's going to hurt you know, our R&D, our investment, that kind of thing. Um, Democrats said, hey, we're willing to play ball on R&D, but, um, but you gotta give us something on the child tax credit. That negotiation did not go well. Uh, both sides felt like they were getting a raw deal. And so they were not able to get a tax deal done. Uh, there were a number of other provisions, the interest deduction, um, uh, I don't know if it should be tax credit, but just interest deduction. Um, for, uh, for businesses, bonus depreciation, um, the 1099K $600 threshold. Of course, the IRS ended up delaying that by a year after Congress couldn't get it done, um, but that's you know still in effect. It'll be in effect for next, um, for next tax season unless they do something. Um, cannabis taxes and banking provisions around, around um, uh, cannabis were, were somewhat lumped into that. And so, you know, one question is, will they be able to get something done this year on any of these things? I think the question's still out there, but but these issues aren't, you know, aren't going away. And um, 1099K was something that came up in Werfel's confirmation hearing uh, yesterday. So congressional calendar, um, just put this up here, you know, when, when folks are in town in May, uh, the House representatives can be in town. And so we're going to be doing a lot, a lot of focus on the House. And then also um, the Senate will, um, uh, the Senate will actually be out, but the staff will be sort of, sometimes it's even better when they're out because the staff is very available to meet and sort of has time. And so we're going to take advantage of that. Um, but uh, uh, this week you had the Senate in and the house out and then they they're both out next week so congressional calendar is always interesting because sometimes they take um 
uh, recess when you'd least expect it. For example, the Senate kind of got a slow start this year because they came in on the third and then they immediately recessed after they got sworn in and weren't back until the, the 24th. So they took the first three weeks of the, of the year off. Um, so it kind of took a little while to get, to get things moving. Uh, but now sort of since the State of the Union's happened, uh, uh, things are moving again. So on to um, IRS. Uh, we put up there transformation or bust because, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty. It's like we all know that the IRS needed more money, but um, what, uh, you know, you need leadership, you need a plan, you need sort of innovative ideas. $80 billion is a lot of money. And so I think the verdict's still out on whether they can pull this off. And um, there have been some short term things um, that we've been happy with. Uh, one area that NAEA has really led on is the phones. Uh, you know, we were hearing in November, or October, November, and December. I mean, and it got really bad in November and December where people could not get through on the PPS line. Um, and you guys know this better than anyone. And NAEA um, wrote some letters on this, got some press. We were, you know, bugging the IRS every day, um, but we really put the pressure, we involved Congress, put the pressure on them, like something has got to change with the phones. Um, and they kept sort of trying to bide more time saying, you know, we're hiring, we're training, we're working on it. Um, but there really was a turnaround uh, after January 1. They brought some people back that I think had been, you know, sent out to work on backlogs and other stuff. And we saw a real turnaround in the phone lines um, and I think NAEA played a, a, an important role in that. Now, of course, there's a little bit of when you take away from one thing, it might hurt in other things. And so the backlogs are still not great. Uh, CAF is taking longer than usual. And so we continue to push them on, on all these things. Michelle and I were on a call right before this where we brought that up with, with some leadership at the IRS. Um, but, um, but hopefully, you know, they don't have the excuse anymore of, um, of we don't have uh, the funding for that because they've got $80 billion. And so hopefully we'll continue to see um, improvements and they'll be able to, um, to hire folks. Um, the, the funding plan. So, you know, uh, Secretary Yellen asked for a plan by February 15th. Uh, they told us this morning it's going over there very soon. It didn't sound like it had gone over there yet. And they said they keep saying um, uh, it's not our role to release this. It'll be up to Yellen if she wants to release it. For now, it's a private document. Um, Werfel, in his nomination hearing, got a lot of, got a lot of um, questions about that yesterday. Will you make it public? He pretty much said he would, but he's not in there yet. Um, but the, you know, the focus they've talked about are, are things that are in their normal strategic plans, things like service, enforcement, people, transformation. Obviously, there's got to be a big emphasis on technology and customer service. Um, the NAEA has weighed in in multiple ways to, to sort of list our priorities. A lot of those having to do with customer service, you know, practitioner priority lines, digital tools for practitioners. Um, those kind of issues um, to make sure those get in the strategic plan. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully they will be in there. Hey, Thad, um, can I jump in with a question yep. for you while we're talking about IRS? Um, and this has come up. This is one of David Miles' biggest issues. And the question is asking, has IRS or Congress or anyone on the Hill given any insight into when the IRS collection programs will resume? It's um, a great question. I mean, the short answer is we don't know exactly when, um, but they have said that um, they have indicated that it, that it will probably start phasing in after um, filing season. And so I have heard sort of anecdotally that they said, you know, um, that they'll do it somewhat gradually and that they want to do it. They want to start returning to some of that this spring, but that it likely won't be, you know, before April 15th or, or April 18th. Um, and so, um, you know, one thing it's been, it's been tied to a couple of things when we've asked this question. 
One is um, the phone lines. They, they have said, well, if you can't get the phone, if you can't get through on the phones, we don't want to restart this program because it's just going to cause more people to call. Um, they've also uh, talked about the backlogs. You know, it's hard in their mind, hard to restart this stuff when you still have these huge backlogs. Um, but, you know, they've also said they want this to be a normal filing season. They want IRS to get back to normal. Obviously, if IRS is not sending out collection notices, if they're not doing liens and levies um, and being sort of doing their normal um, course of business in these areas, um, IRS is not back to normal. And so um, I, I guess short answer is I don't think we're going to be there in the next couple of months, but, but we might start getting back to that after the, um, you know, after the filing season. Um, and, and as the backlogs go down, as they're able to hire more people, I think it's going to make it easier for them to, to pull that trigger. Any other questions? Uh, Michelle, I haven't been reading, but I see that. Um, there's one, box. there's a question, you know, we, uh, Eric Duncan brought it to us the other day. We, we seem to get a lot of questions about this Connecticut proposal from everybody, but people in Connecticut. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, so we're I, taking a heart. We are taking a look at that. Michelle's yeah. on it. We, the government relations committee, is on that, and we're consulting with some people in Connecticut. So, um, you know, I don't know what kind of legs it really has, but but we're not ignoring it. And the other head question has to do with the flying, and maybe we can touch on that later on. Okay. Well, so and I'm, and we, we've got a decent amount of time left, but sort of the. Um, the thing we wanted to end with is around um, Danny Werfel and the and the confirmation. Um, you know, we made this we made this deck. We finished this deck just before his confirmation hearing um, yesterday. So that picture is actually when he was up for confirmation last time as controller. He looks a little older now. Um, Not much though. Just yeah, he still looks. Yeah, he still looks like a young guy. His kids are a little older, although you can't see his kids in this picture. But um, so, um, you know, and I'll be interested in your th thoughts, Michelle, and I know we've talked some about this. I think the highlight of, to me, the sort of main thing coming out of this hearing is there was an expectation at least a couple of months ago that it was going to be very heated and partisan when we had an IRS nominee, because people were feeling hot about the 80 billion. They were feeling frustrated about the IRS. There were these ProPublica articles about, you know, that potentially came from leaks at the IRS. And so, you know, um, there was a lot of sort of division and partisan hostility around, around the IRS. And um, I think I said on one of these calls, when we were meeting, when Meg and I met with the Senate Finance Committee, um, this was probably in November. And I said, is there any chance we could have a bipartisan, you know, if, 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 if it's a really good nominee that, um, you know, has a business background, is there any chance that Republicans would get on board and this thing could be bipartisan? And they, the Republican staff kind of laughed at me and said, not a, not a chance, you know, um, and which, which was disappointing, but that's kind of how it's turned out to be because mm -hmm. I think, you know, Werfel's background, which is, is he's technical, he's got experience in the private sector, he's got experience in the public sector, he knows the agency, he's all about sort of big IT change. He's not seen as a, you know, an ideologue at all. And Republican senators sort of came around to him. And I think he did a good job probably laying the groundwork meeting with them. And so by the time the hearing happened yesterday, we did not hear a lot of that uh, partisan red meat on either side. Now, there were a few senators on each side that sort of made their made their points, but most of it was, thank you for being willing to take on this impossible job. There's, we need a plan. We need to know how you're going to do this. We need you to be transparent. We need you to protect the privacy of, of our people, you know, of, of taxpayers. And so they asked pointed questions but they weren't attacking him as an individual. They weren't sort of saying there's no way you can get through this, you know, committee or, or, or Senate. And so I was surprised at how civil it was and how constructive some of the conversation was. 
Of course, they don't always go deep in the details in these hearings. They kind of say, well, when I get in there, we'll, we'll take a look at that. But I think the, the general topics and the general discussion were very civil. Um, but Michelle, before, before we get into the, some of the details, I'll, I'll throw it to you to see. Well, you know, he came across as a really likable person, willing to, to do everything that needed to be done. Um, even the, the senators who were questioning him would preface their questions with, well, you're likely to be confirmed. And that was coming from Republicans. So it wasn't exactly a love fest but it certainly was not uh, acrimonious at all. And he handled himself really, really well. And um, I think everybody's just looking forward to working with him and seeing what he's gonna do. I mean, he talked about some changes that, that would be possible and how to integrate new things into, into old programs and to uh, get, get things started. But um, I think he's gonna be a great breath of fresh air over there. I agree. And, and from what we've heard, they desperately need some leadership. I mean, the, all those folks are, are trying their best. But I think when you've got something as big as an $80 billion pot of money and you're being told to transform the agency and, and you know, fix all these problems, there's got to be sort of a, a visionary leader that can drive that. And, and so I think that it's desperately needed to have someone um, get in there. Just a few of the... I think his age it works for him too, and and um, it, it it to me it it was a prelude to maybe a, a more younger people coming into the IRS, and um, so all good. Yeah, there there were lots of questions about the all the people that qualify for retirement at IRS. How are you going to get new people? And and he um, you know, he didn't have any magic answers, but he talked about some of his strategies about. Re aggressively recruiting, about looking at veterans, looking at yeah. re retirees that have a lot of expertise that might want to come back and do some public service, um, working with OPM on like various hiring authorities. So, you know, I think that's the, that's a major, major challenge. Yeah. Um, so a few, of the, I'll just hit through some of the topics that, that came up. Um, phone service and PPS, there was a lot of play on that. I think um, NAEA's work um, probably was a, a big part of that because when we were sharing those letters, when we were kind of taking those surveys and 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 um, stressing how frustrating it was for tax professionals, we were sharing all of that with the congressional offices and, and folks were listening. And so we had um, a lot of senators bring up the phones and frustration with the PPS. Um, Customer service generally was obviously a huge topic. The need for more digital tools um, across the board, you know, two-way communication where, um, as one senator said, I don't want it just where the IRS can reach the taxpayer electronically. I want the taxpayer to be able to reach, you know, the IRS electronically. So um, there was discussion around that. Um, interestingly, Senator Brown from Ohio brought up the regulation of tax preparers and said, you know, do we, it's part of the issues we're having because of some bad actors out there, do we need to give the IRS more authority to regulate tax preparers, which of course has been an NAEA priority. Um, he kind of demurred on that and said, well, I'm not, you know, I'd have to talk to Treasury or something. So he didn't, even though IRS has always wanted that, he sort of stayed, uh, Werfel sort of didn't, didn't, wholeheartedly embrace it, but it was interesting that that Brown um, brought it up. Um, a lot of focus on the 80 billion, would the plan, when would the plan be, you know, what would the plan be? Would it be transparent? Would it be open to the public? Werfel was very much like, yes, I wanna make it, you know, transparent. I wanna work with this committee. Um, obviously lots on the paper backlogs, the need to increase um, e-filing. Um, questions about the handling of leaks and sort of punishment of employees if, if they do leak. Um, some questions about the $600 1099K threshold. Uh, they really framed it, which, which I thought was interesting as a privacy issue. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the senators said, you know, I reimbursed, I think it was Senator Lankford um, yeah. Yeah. from Kansas said, I reimbursed my teenage daughter like, you know, every, every week for something on, um, 
on Venmo. Venmo. <laughs> Do I really have to, you know, should I really be getting a 1099K for that? These are personal expenses. And, and, um, and so Werfel was very much like, you know, we need to strike that balance between um, not unnecessarily intruding on people's lives, but also getting the, the information we need so that, you know, we can make sure taxes are collected that are due. Um, and so that was sort of a running theme. Um, in terms of audits, you know, this will, we won't audit, we won't increase auditing of anyone under $400,000. I kind of joked that the first half of the hearing, they made it sound like no one under $400,000 would have to pay any taxes because they kept saying, well, you're not going to, you know, go after anyone under 400,000, are you? And they're saying, no, 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 we're not touching anybody. And, you know, these people, we shouldn't, it, it made it seem like no one was going to pay any taxes. And then it was actually Senator Tillis who said, let me get something straight though. You're going to still collect taxes owed on people that owe, you know, that make under 400,000, right? And Werfel said, yes, very good point. You know, what Yellen promised is we won't increase the ratio or amount of audits, you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act funds on people making less than $400,000. Um, but lots of talk about, well, where is the tax gap and what should we prioritize this? You know, Wyden kept saying we should go after the billionaires and, and corporations. And then some other members were saying, is that where the tax gap is? If so, fine. But if it's somewhere else, let's not do it just to do it, you know? And so he, you know, that's where Werfel was sort of like, I need to get in there. I need to review all the data. We'll use the data to make these decisions. We're going to, you know, try to close the gap where we need to. Um, and, um, and talk about an, it was talk about an equitable and fair tax administration system. And he sort of touted that, that's one of the first tenets of tax administration is it needs to be fair, you know, as unbiased as, as possible. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, as I said, the Senate was in this week, they left the record open so senators could, could put in questions that will be sent to him in writing uh, up until the end of day Friday. So, which I guess is tomorrow. So, um, so that'll be open until then. They actually go on recess next week for President's Day week. Um, and so I don't think there'll be any um, activity other than him sort of, you know, trying to answer these written questions and stuff in the next week. But when they get back at the end of February, early March, um, I know that um, the committee has said they want to move quickly. And so at some point they will vote him out of committee. Uh, it'll be interesting to see you know, if it's a party line vote or if a lot of these Republicans that seem supportive will, will vote for him in committee. Um, but then it'll go to the floor. And, um, and I think the presumption at this point, unless something, you know, crazy came up is that he'll, he'll be confirmed by the Senate. Uh, the big question is timing. Does that happen in early March? Does it get pushed to late March? Um, that is, um, is unclear, but, um, but it's moving along. Um, one thing I did want to say, I can't remember, I don't think I said this at the top. So um, NAEA wrote an endorsement letter endorsing Werfel. We sent that last week. We, we tried to get it out as much as possible. I was able to talk to him after the hearing, and I told him that I worked with NAEA and that we had sent that letter. And he said, yes, I saw the letter. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And, and that was part of our goal was to build some goodwill and you know, send it out early enough to where it could have a little bit of a, make a little bit of a difference or, or at least let him know that, um, you know, we're supportive and we want to work with him. And we raised some of the issues we care about, you know, in the letter. Um, but we just said, we feel like there needs to be leadership at the IRS and, and your, your qualifications and resume fit the bill. So, um, so we're looking forward, you know, to working with him once, once he gets there. Um, Let's see, it's 154. I can't believe we... Uh... <laughs> well, let me jump in with the fly-in a little bit. All right. Uh, we had a question about whether there would be guidance on the fly-in. Yes, and there will be. Um, the the, the fly-in this year is a two-day event. The first day is a legislative conference. Second day is the meetings on the Hill. Um, at the end of that first day, there will be a session on, 
on guidance on, on how to do your meetings, your one-on-one -on -one meetings with your congressman and, and the Senator, Senate representatives that we can meet with. So that, that will be happening at, towards the end of that first day. But some good news is um, the, um, we have a panel of former IRS commissioners, and we've already had responses from three, Charles Rosati, Fred Goldberg, and John Costin. They are eager and interested and willing to participate in a former IRS leaders panel. Um, we're trying to track down a, a contact information for Mr. Reddick so we can invite him as well. That is looking to be a really great panel. And then we also have our invitation into the IRS for Danny Werfel to come and speak at a, a following that former commissioner's panel. That would be a, a great morning for us if we can pull all that off. And then in the afternoon, we have some congressional panels planned and administration people. But it's going to be a great first day leading up to the second day of the meetings with all these new members that that has pointed out. Um, it, it'll be a great time for people coming to the flying to get to know their members, to explain what an EA is to them if they don't know, what the value you have in your communities, and uh, and how important your profession is. And so we're we're looking for um, some really good outcomes from this fly-in on a relationship building level. And we hope to then, after the fly-in sometime later in the year, maybe set up some more of those small group meetings like we did last year between members and various members on Ways and Means and, and uh, Senate Finance, so. Yeah, I think it's gonna be exciting. I think the day of sort of speakers and panels will be really good. It'll give folks a chance to connect with everyone else and also with the, um, with the panelists and, and listen to some really good programming. The weather, um, you know, in mid-May is always beautiful and um, in DC. So I think the time of the year is gonna be great. And then of course, it's always fun to go to the Hill and um, the Hill is now finally open. Um, you know, last year you could get in for a meeting but you had to have an escort and you were waiting outside, you know, sweating or in the rain or whatever, trying to, trying to you know, describe to someone on the phone well i'm in a dark suit with a blue tie and you know <laughs> i've got black shoes on and um and then some staffer would come out and start you know yelling your name um and so it is now open where you can walk into the buildings go where you want um which is exciting so a lot a lot more uh, sort of activity and, and getting back to normal on the hill and um and a lot of staffers are excited to you know excited too that they can actually meet with people in person. Um, and so this is gonna be a great event. I think we are, there's already been a huge response. I know it's capped. I think we're capping it at a hundred people. So sign, if you wanna go sign up sooner rather than later, you don't wanna, you don't wanna be one of the ones, you know, put on a wait list. Um, and um, I will leave it at that, but uh, unless there are any, any more questions. No, 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 no more questions today. We let you off the hook. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope this was helpful to people. Uh, and uh, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. And Jessica, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Thad. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you to all for attending this webinar. Thank you for your participation and interest in NAEA's government relations work. The recording of this webinar will be posted on NAEA's YouTube channel in the next few days for replay. This concludes today's program. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a great day. Great. Thanks. Thank you.